that comes next? I, have <laughs> I actually don't even remember. Hi, I'm Genevieve, Deputy Editor and Columnist with NYT Cooking, and I'm here today to show you how to make hot cross buns. For me, hot cross buns, when I was a kid, it was this magical thing that I didn't know anything about. And when I got older, I happened to be in England during the Lenten season, and I saw them everywhere in all of these bakeries. And it was so amazing. Like any risen dough recipe, it does take a lot of time just because you have to wait for the dough to rise. But it's a project that's totally worth it. There's just nothing like baking them yourself, but also because this dough feels really great. So there is this thing where it's like these foods that loomed so large in my mind as a kid. For sure, hot crust buns was one of them. And when you make them, when you bake them, and then you eat them, you're like, oh my god, this is real. I mean, now I see them in the supermarkets here. I see them in bakeries. A lot of times what I see, at least in the US, are buns that feel like brioche, and they're like round, and they're really quite buttery and tender and eggy. But the hot crust buns I remember first having in England were much more like buns. like stretchy dough, chewy buns. They were a little sweet, but they weren't super sweet, right? They were mainly sweet from the dried fruit, and they were a little spiced, but not super spiced like gingerbread. And the thing I remember the most distinctly is that they come in these trays where they're all sort of baked together and risen together. So you get those nice, like, stretchy dough edges where they meet and pull them apart. And of course, the most important thing about a hot crust bun is the cross on top. So what I'm doing is I'm heating the milk, and if you're using instant yeast, you can actually heat the milk higher, but I actually prefer the slower rise of active dry yeast. I'm gonna pour out just a quarter cup of the milk, and I'm gonna activate the yeast in this milk. I can see it's still steaming, so I know it's too hot. If your milk is too hot or any liquid's too hot, it's gonna kill the yeast, and you don't wanna do that. I am gonna toss my flour in here, and this is bread flour. You don't have to use bread flour for this. You can actually use all-purpose flour. Ground cinnamon, ginger, and cardamom. Salt is one of the keys to delicious bread. If you've ever made bread dough and forgotten the salt, which I totally have done, it is not great. All right, so I'm gonna check on this again. And it's actually 102, which is fine. So I am going to both mix in a teaspoon of sugar the yeast feeds on the sugar. So we're gonna let this sit for about five minutes until it's foamy. You'll see it change from these little granules of yeast to become foamy on top. So while I'm waiting for that to happen, what I wanna do is get the rest of the milk ready for the dough. I add my butter just in this big old hunk. So bread baking can seem intimidating, but I think the pandemic actually proved that it's not because we had a whole nation of people making sourdough. But sweet bread also is really straightforward and simple. Like this is it, these are all the ingredients. There's really nothing to it. You're mixing your dry ingredients with your wet ingredients. We're gonna knead the dough, shape it. I always mix my dough by hand, is you just break it up yourself, which is a really sort of fun feeling. So you can see that this is quite sticky, and you're gonna think, oh, do I need to flour the surface? You actually don't necessarily need to flour the surface because one of the things that's really nice about bread dough is that as you knead it, the flour is gonna continue to absorb all those wet ingredients. So you know your dough is ready when it's so smooth, and it feels, I hate that comparison that it feels like a baby's bottom, but it does because it's so soft and smooth. And this is when you know that you're gonna be ready to add your dried fruit. And instead of just trying to like force the fruit in here, I find it's easier if I go ahead and stretch my dough out a little bit. And this is what I mean by elastic, right? So when you're like smooth and elastic, what does that mean? Like it feels like a rubber band. Like when you pull it, it feels like one of those big rubbery rubber bands. What I can do then is dump my raisins in here, dump my dried bits of candied orange peel in here. And I'm not making cinnamon rolls or whatever here, but this is again just an easy way to get the dried fruit evenly incorporated without too much effort on your part. I want it to really like work into the dough. So here we go. I can see that all the little bits are all mixed in. And one thing I like to do, but is totally not necessary, is I then like to sort of tuck the fruit in for the dough to rise instead of having it um, up on the surface, but it's totally fine if they're on the surface too. And at this point, you're not really working the dough anymore, you're just trying to get the fruit mixed in nicely. So what I've done is 
I'm forming this into a nice tight ball. I pop this ball in here. I then roll it around a little bit. So now every surface of the dough is also buttered. And I want it to double in size and to feel really airy, but you actually might find that that time varies from an hour all the way up to two hours. So I usually say an hour and a half. An hour and a half is the sweet spot for dough rising. So I can see this is definitely doubled in size and soft and puffy. So now that I know my dough is ready, I'm going to go ahead and get the pan ready first. Generously butter it both so that it doesn't stick, but also it just gives it a nice extra bit of flavor. So this dough doesn't get sticky. I'm going to turn out this guy and pop it onto my scale. It's about 1,200 grams, which is easy. I want 12 rolls, about 100 grams each. So the way that you can divide this evenly is you don't have to have a scale. I just try to sh make it into some sort of even-ish shape. And then I just go half, and you just sort of keep having it. And the other thing you can do instead is you can, for sure, just tear it apart with your hands as well. That's always an option. It doesn't have to be super duper exact, but basically somewhere between 90 and 100 grams each. And you can tear off, you can add a little bit more to make sure it's right. So here are our 12 hunks of dough. Because of all the sugar in the fruit, it can burn. So what I do is I take the dough and I sort of fold it over so that it's dough on the outside and I tuck all the dried fruit bits in. If they're sort of floppy when they rise, they'll also be a little wonky, which again, it's fine. It'll taste good, but it'll taste better. Uh, if you get them nice and tight. And the way that I do that, I do it for this, I do it for like plain dinner rolls. You take this ball of dough and you put it seam side down on the counter and you cup your hand over it and just sort of gently rotate it. And what's happening is you, you'll feel it under your hand. You'll feel the dough sort of spiral and tighten into itself. I see those raisins like really wanting to burst, so I'm not gonna let it do that. I'm gonna check the bottom again to see if my seam came undone and it did a tiny bit. So I'm just pinching that seam again but this is all ready to go. So now I can throw that into the pan. I'm sure you could do this so much faster if you weren't so type A like me. But here we have our dozen buns all ready and they're evenly spaced within this pan because what you want them to do is to rise evenly and then you want them all to stick together like buddies. And the best way to let them rise now at this point, um, I find, is with this trick that I learned from Sarah Beth Levine. Uh, she's the owner of Sarah Best Bakery, or if you've ever had Sarah Best Jam, she's just a brilliant, brilliant baker. So I'm taking a clean, unscented, uh, this is like a recycling bag, but you can use like a big, big produce bag. And I'm sliding this pan in here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna take just a glass that's taller than the side of the pan, and I'm gonna take some uh, water that's just been boiled. And I'm going to stick this in here, into this bag. Right. And basically what I'm creating is this like warm, steamy environment. Here you really want the tops of the buns to stay nice and moist. I need to stop using the word moist. There's just like not another word in the English, because they're not juicy. It's not like the bread is juicy. You just want it to stay not dry. <laughs> So I'm gonna get the flour paste ready to pipe on top to make the cross shape. But to give this paste a little more flavor, I wanna use orange blossom water. And orange blossom water is so delicious. It's the scent of orange blossoms, and it's actually different from the taste of, say, orange zest. I always actually give it a sniff first, and it, oh my God, it smells so good. All you're doing is making a little paste, super easy. And you're gonna use this to pipe on top, and it's gonna bake right onto the dough. You can see this is nice and smooth, and it's also, you want it to be sort of wet because you're gonna be piping it up. And you can see why we wanted to create this special proofing bag, because we really wanted these buns to rise and spread so much that they're really buddies here. They're not just like touching at the edges, but a little smooshed against each other. So now we're just gonna pipe on the crosses. So when the buns are almost done, I am gonna get a glaze ready to go on top. So if you've ever seen hot crust buns, they will often have this gorgeous shine on them. 
And the glaze I'm making is just the simplest combination of sugar and water. I'm not even gonna bring it to a boil. All I'm trying to do here is dissolve the sugar until the mixture is clear. I have seen in England some people will do a glaze with Lyle's Golden Syrup, which is a really quintessential British ingredient, and it's really tasty, and you can do that. And then I'm just gonna add a tiny splash. It's delicate and it's wonderful, but it's also powerful at the same time. And while they're really hot, I'm just gonna go ahead and start brushing this syrup all over. You can hear it sizzling in the bottom of the pan. And as the song says, these are hot cross buns, so you wanna eat them hot. But honestly, like if you were to try to eat one right now, you would just burn your mouth. So you do wanna let it cool at least a little bit before you tear into them. So I'm just gonna pry this guy out. And that stretchy bit of dough is my favorite. And I just peel it off. Mmm. Well, it's so tasty. Just the right amount of spice and sweetness, and it's just like the perfect little bun for breakfast or for tea time or really just any time.